Go, 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 go! Holy moly! We're in Afghanistan, the snow-capped mountains of Panjshir. Workers have placed explosives inside the mountain and we have five seconds to clear the explosion site. I honestly didn't think I'd have to run that far. I got really scared. So fuck! Oh. And we're among the first foreigners who got here to film the entire workflow. I thought they would just have to get outside the entrance and, you know, take cover behind the corner, but once we got out, they kept shouting, go down, go down, keep going. And you know what just happened? The guys who brought me here had stayed behind in the tunnel, and I won't be able to make it out of this place without them. I guess things like this only happen in Afghanistan. When the guys were placing explosives, they forgot about the chief engineer and my guard with a gun. I'm laughing because of the shock. It's a nervous laugh. The situation is not funny at all. Three years ago, once the US troops left Afghanistan, the power in the country was seized by the Taliban. The authorities in Russia, the United States, and many other countries have been strongly discouraging their citizens from traveling to Afghanistan ever since. Hostilities in the country are still ongoing. A few days before our arrival, terrorists attacked foreign tourists at a market in the city of Bamiyan. Eight people were killed. On the day I arrived in Kabul, an explosion rocks the city. ISIS militants blew up a Taliban checkpoint, and now my guides are telling me to be a little more careful with all the filming. While I was taking some footage of the local scenes, I was warned to try and conceal my camera as much as I can for the time being. We'll travel all over the country and show you the real Afghanistan. A country where war is part of ordinary life. Because everybody here is at war with somebody, even today. Right now, I'm standing on a Soviet tank that was abandoned in this field almost 40 years ago. All this time, local farmers have been working the land around the tank, growing crops, while the tank kept standing on this very spot. We will visit a museum for weapons and ammo where they have real landmines on display. We will show you people who still get hurt by these landmines. We'll visit local markets where people sell gear abandoned by the US troops and find out what happens in the end to those people who tried to escape with the Americans trying to get on the last planes leaving. We'll ask the locals about their attitude towards the Russians, who also had their troops stationed here once, while the remnants of that war can still be found all over the country. This trip is promising to be dangerous and full of risks. My guides are literally praying that we all get to our destination in one piece, and most importantly, come back after that. This is Alex Pototsky, reporting for The People Project. Off we go. Are you subscribed to our channel? Not yet? The sad thing is that Anton can't go on his next adventure until you do. So pretty please, subscribe now. That's right, go ahead, click subscribe. Well done and thank you. We can continue now. 
Life has taken a sharp turn here in Afghanistan three years ago, and a lot has changed. Look, for example, at this ordinary advertisement, all the faces, both women's and men's, are painted over. There are almost no women on the streets. But there are quite a lot of men with automatic rifles that are now a regular part of the crowd in the streets. These are members of the Taliban. They are now the new authorities keeping order. Here is what happened to us, for an example. As we were driving, a guy in another car noticed my camera and simply cut in front of our car. You know, we were driving, I was simply taking some footage of the street with people and cars around us, and then the Taliban guys in another car cut in front of us to stop and question us, like who we are, why I was using a camera, who I am, and so on. All in all, it ended peacefully. So that's just it. I guess I just need to try and show my camera less to people and hope it will be enough to save us from more problems. Listening to music, singing or dancing is officially forbidden now in Afghanistan. So we're just sitting in a car and violating a law, no less. Do you think you can guess what it is, what we're doing wrong? We are listening to some music. We've got a track playing in our car and that's been outlawed by the Taliban in this country. I knew about this law when I was first planning this trip and I thought it would be enforced quite strictly, you know? But the fact is, it's not that bad. We were taking a ride through central Kabul listening to some music and no one's coming to arrest us or shoot us on the spot. Traffic in Afghanistan is something entirely out of this world. Many cars don't have license plates for starters. Others have them painted over. If a guy decides he needs to step out, he does it right in the middle of the road. If another guy decides to take a turn, he goes ahead, cutting through the traffic like it's no biggie. This guy is trying hard to bring some order into this chaos, but it looks like no one is paying much attention. I really find the traffic in Kabul a lot of fun, really, because it's utter and complete chaos. Cars cut in front of each other and they drive too close to each other. During my first ride here, I literally grabbed my seat expecting an impact any second because it felt like we were going to get hit by this car or another all the time. You know, the traffic here is like everyone drives as they see fit while you make your way through it somehow. Also, people on foot don't pay attention to traffic and walk right in front of the cars. So when you're driving, you've got to look out for them in order not to run anyone over. We made a stop at one of the parks in the center of the city and look what's going on here. I just witnessed something I find really hard to wrap my mind around. All these guys here are with the Taliban. They're holding hands and performing a traditional Pashtun dance while singing a traditional Pashtun song. For me, it's so unexpected, it's a real shock, because I never expected to see the Taliban sing and dance like this in public in broad daylight. And there are lots of people here, a real crowd. Many are filming them on their phones while others are just watching and listening. So let's start by making it clear. Who are these people called the Taliban? A Talib means a student in Arabic. Originally, the Taliban indeed largely consisted of students of traditional Islamic schools, madrasas. They were radicalized by Pakistan's secret services. Pakistan also supplied weapons and sought to use the faction to wage a proxy war against Afghanistan's government. The Taliban sees its ultimate goal is establishing a religious state as opposed to a secular one and restoring what they call the golden age of Islam in Afghanistan. Our team's mission is to show you how people live in four different places of this country. 
We'll start with the capital city, and from there we will cross tall mountains to go to Kunduz. After that, we'll drive to Afghanistan's top tourist destination, Bamiyan. And finally, we'll head to the emerald mines of Panjshir. That part of the country is known for active hostility, so we'll have to cross many checkpoints and get okayed by many local commanders. The two strictest rules to follow are not to film the checkpoints and not to film women without their permission. However, since talking to women is also forbidden, getting permission is out of the question anyway. Also, there are almost no women in the streets. The entire public space looks like it's a men-only state. When people see me, they usually first get a bit shy. Well, some do. While others come right away and ask to have a photo with me. Ask me where I'm from. Everyone's so friendly and smiling. I made what feels like hundreds of photos with locals. And I've seen hundreds of friendly smiles around. And you know, all this happened in a country that's considered one of the most dangerous places in the world. 200 First order of business is to get our money changed into the local currency. One option is to go to a bank, but the exchange rates in banks are rip-offs. So, everyone prefers to go to Money Street Changes. And that's how it's done. You come here, see a man with a big wad of notes, and he's the one you need. Guys like this can be spotted everywhere in Kabul. They just sit or stand by the road, and you can recognize them by the wads of currency in their hands. We used to have many thieves and robbers, but now it's over. They're all hiding. I can sit here with all this money in my hands. I'm holding $2,000 worth of currency, and I'm not afraid of anything. If you need to make a wire transfer to send or receive some money from abroad, you also need a local fixer. Before, the bank system was okay, not bent. Now you know the bank system in Afghanistan are bent from America. So they go to a teller in Europe. They give the money that give the, they have branches in other countries, also the main branches here in Kabul. When they give to that branch money, directly they, they pay to him because they are in touch. In Afghanistan, you can find things you'd never seen or expected to see anywhere else. This here, for example, is a local ID copy center. The locals who have to use their local IDs often use their services to make copies of their IDs. The local custom is to keep the original documents somewhere in a safe place at home, so they can't be lost or stolen. Instead, people carry copies, in case they need to show them to the authorities. It took these guys less than 10 minutes to make a copy of my passport, featuring two front pages. Although I had asked them to make only the first one with the data. And the other side of this card features a copy of my visa to Afghanistan. And now I can use this card, this virtually fake ID, to present to the Taliban authorities whenever they want to see my passport, instead of giving them my real passport and the real visa. Now to check out what's going on next door to the copy center guys. This is probably the most unusual service of all I've seen here. That's how they clean phones. You come to a guy like this and he turns on his tool and he polishes your phone all over. It costs 20 Afghanis, which is less than a dollar, even less than 50 cents. And it's in demand with the locals. And now my phone is squeaky clean.
Once the Taliban seized power, it became safe to travel almost everywhere in Afghanistan. Of course, there are still some places where access to foreigners is restricted, and today, we're going to one of those such places. We're on our way to the Panjshir Valley, one of the provinces that the Taliban is not in full control of. The resistance from the local insurgents is ongoing. Hostilities break out from time to time, which is why the access is controlled by many checkpoints. And any of them can be expected to send a foreigner like me back where I came from. To avoid this, we've secured the services of this guy here. He's driving now. His name is Masut, and he is the son of the Taliban commander in charge of the area we're now going to. So I hope that the connection to that commander will help me get to the place I really want to show you. These two guys in the back are a local guide and an interpreter. So as you see, a team of three is accompanying me as I'm leaving Kabul. And later, I found out that there were in fact more. We just cleared one major checkpoint as we were leaving Kabul. The next one will be on the border with the neighborhood province. Of course, we were stopped, but everything went fine. They asked us where we're going, took my passport, took photos, took down all our data, and then asked the guys accompanying me some questions while recording them. That was it. And then they let us go. We'll have to go through at least five more checkpoints, and they won't be as easy since we're going to an active conflict zone. But my driver doesn't seem to be worried at all. Once we get out of town, he turns the volume up. This is pretty cringy, really. Hey. No, no, no. Not everything on this market is a feast for the eye. Here, for example, is a chicken aisle with live chickens, like here. And right next to it, they butcher them and cut them into pieces. And they've got all these freshly butchered chickens hanging. And the smell in this place is, at the least, not very appetizing. However, the locals regard this display of things as a proof of freshness. Next door is a street food vendor who cooks these freshly buttered chickens, and the smell here is absolutely delicious. The display of fresh vegetables and fries makes it even harder to resist. The dish I'm about to try is called Jiga Kebabs. It's made of chicken liver, and the liver is obviously sourced from all those chickens I just saw live and then slaughtered and then processed right in front of me. So, here it is, the freshly cooked chicken liver dish, and it is served with this big Afghan flatbread. That's because the locals use pieces of this bread to pick up the chunks of meat and the sauce and eat it all together. In other words, bread is used instead of a spoon. But my skill level in this game is still zero, and only my second day in Afghanistan, so I asked them to give me a spoon. Once I finish my lunch, it's time to discover one more local custom, cleaning teeth with sticks. He's got some incense in this box and a bunch of sticks they use in Afghanistan to clean teeth. It's just a bundle of twigs by the look of it. But these twigs are really used to clean teeth here and he's going to show me. So he prepares one stick for me, it serves as both the toothbrush and the toothpaste, two in one the Afghan way. And I'm gonna give it a try, right now. 
updated. This teeth cleaning twig is called a miswak, and it's used by people in many countries of the world. And I even saw it on sale at home. So, I'm cleaning my teeth with my new buddy, who is teaching me to do it the way people do in Afghanistan. By the way, this wood is quite juicy. Since I had to bite it first, I got a taste. First it was kind of sweet, then a bit sour, and only after that it began to taste like wood. You know, if you ever tried to chew a twig when you were a kid, you know what it's like. We're getting close to the Panjshir Valley. Here's one more checkpoint, but this one looks easy too. A couple of guys with guns and concrete fortifications. In local terms, it's a regular kind of checkpoint. But then, the road suddenly ends. The pavement ends. And as we're about to hit the rocks, a local kid signals to us that we have to turn. So we're about to enter the Panjshir Valley. As you can see, we are surrounded by tall mountains. Our road goes right between them, and right here is the Panjshir River. It shares the name with the valley. We've just cleared another checkpoint. The guys accompanying me had warned me that this one was going to be the hardest to get through. So they told me ahead of time to not simply hide the camera, but to pack it into a bag and put that bag somewhere in the trunk. This checkpoint is a strategic facility, and no one is allowed to shoot or take pictures here, not even with a phone. So the scenery is now different as we've entered the mountains of Panjshir. And these mountains are my final destination on this trip. Here, people mine precious and semi-precious stones, emeralds and lapis lazuli. However, local mountains are also a known hiding place of the ISIS militants. And running into them would mean, quite literally, a death sentence. We drove by a house of the leader of the insurgents fighting the Taliban. He's not there, he's fled to Pakistan now. The Taliban are guarding his house, and there's a strict no-camera policy in the area. This valley is probably the last place in Afghanistan where the war is still going on right now, because of the resistance here. They don't recognize the Taliban, and they want a free Panjshir. This province is only an hour's drive from Kabul, and it is considered the most dangerous place in the country. These mountains are a perfect hiding place for any number of insurgents, whether it's a few soldiers or a full-scale army. Everything that moves along this road is an easy target for shooters that may be hiding way up high. And right now, it could be the ISIS fighters who are in conflict with the Taliban and can attack at any time. Now our driver looks like a real Taliban fighter. You can see he's wrapped himself in this big scarf. To keep it in place, he's actually holding it with his teeth. Can you imagine that? And he put it on on purpose to give the people we are yet to come across the right impression from the very start. Because there will be more checkpoints. We will be stopped and questioned again. Because as I already mentioned, this area is not very safe. It is not fully controlled by the Taliban and anything can happen here. Today, it's not even clear who is in power in Afghanistan. The real Taliban leaders don't give interviews, neither do they appear in public. In essence, Afghanistan is a war-torn country. Its people have been at war with many foreign powers, trying to restore some order, and they are at war with each other. Check out this impressive timeline that covers the last 50 years. In 1973, they had a coup d'etat overthrowing the monarchy. It was followed by a revolution in 1978. In 1979, the USSR sent in troops in support of the country's new socialist government. A decade later, in 1989, the Afghan civil war broke out. It raged until seven years later, when the Taliban seized power. Then, it was relatively quiet until 2001 when the USA sent its troops into the country. In 2021, the Taliban retook control of Afghanistan. The hostilities continue until today. By now, two generations of people were born and grew up in Afghanistan who never saw a day of peace. Now, this is the Mine and Unexploded Ordnance War Museum in Kabul. It has exhibits from all over Afghanistan.
Afghanistan is a country where war never seems to stop at all. So many different weapons have been used here. It's been enough to fill a whole museum. Here, for example, are the landmines collected from all over the country. And even today, mines just like these go off, killing and maiming locals. I kid you not, this place looks like a collection of munitions from all armies of the world. These are Russian. Uh, this, uh, this is Pakistani. This is Chinese, this is Iranian, this is Italian. They've got dozens, if not hundreds of mines, including those that are prohibited by all international conventions. These here are, for example, the infamous cluster bombs that can kill people for miles and miles around the primary explosion site. They, they go out, but by this parachute they come down. And when the uh, earth become hard, they blast it. If the earth become uh, and, uh, soft, uh, they will go under the dust, but anyone cannot see. This is another type of banned munitions. They are called butterfly mines. They are scattered from planes. If you step on one, you lose a leg. They come in different colors and are notorious for attaining good camouflage in the conditions of dense foliage, snow or sand. I want to make an important disclaimer now. The only reason I'm talking about these killing machines is to show you how fragile and extremely valuable a human life is. I was 20 at the time. I was in the mountains with my sheep and suddenly there was an explosion. I immediately realized that it was a landmine, but I couldn't understand whether I stepped on it myself or if it was one of my sheep. Later, I found out it was a butterfly mine. You can't see it on the ground at all. I lost my leg and three of my sheep got killed. This man's name is Abdul Wadud. We simply saw him on a street. He walks around selling some plastic jars. He's carrying dozens of them on a big stick. You don't immediately realize he's got a prosthetic leg. It looks like he's got a limp, that's all, but his leg is missing, even though it still hurts. I had to somehow raise $1,500 in less than two months' time to get this prosthetic leg. It was an unthinkable amount for an ordinary shepherd like me. I can still feel my missing leg, and it's still hurting. A previous lens, um, the, uh, there was from the 200 uh, up to 100 in Parman. Uh, but now the casualty rate is 60 people, uh, most of them are children, so while they are going to the uh, collecting their scrap, metals or... My head is spinning as I'm looking at all these sophisticated inventions made by humans to kill other humans. <laughs> Guys, if you like my video and if you like what we are doing, I would really appreciate if you support us on Patreon, on Pioneer or on PayPal and we try to make even more great films from new dangerous places for you. Thank you. All the links are in the description. Please donate. At some point, we were joined by one more Taliban official who is representing the armed forces of the province. In total, I've now got four guys accompanying me, one of them with a gun. As you can see, it's getting pretty loud in the car. The guys are all talking, discussing something or maybe arguing. Finally, we are taken to a two-story building behind a tall fence with a white flag of the Taliban on it. It wasn't very clear why we had to go there. We had been cleared by several checkpoints now. The building looks a lot like a school, but there are no children inside. It turns out it's the seat of the local authorities. I'm not really free to film inside, but I'm taking this chance as I'm drinking my tea. The representatives of the ruling organization have requested to meet us, and we are here now to finalize the paperwork with the local officials. We need to have their permission on paper to continue on our way. The officials assigned one more soldier to accompany our group, so in the end I had a security detail of a total of five men. 
But the most interesting thing happened when I had no opportunity to film. So I really wanted to tell you what happened to me and my group in that building. In order to get an official permit to continue our journey, we were invited to the Council of Local Taliban Leaders. It's a body of authority that consists of real field commanders, of big bearded men who sit in an office and give audience to the people who have requests or some issues they need help with. I still find it hard to believe I got to see it with my own eyes. You know, when we were taken there, I felt quite a bit overwhelmed because, you know, we opened the door and there was a room full of Taliban leaders with beards, all sitting on cushions and discussing something. But as soon as we entered, they got up and greeted us. They shook our hands. Then they invited me to sit next to their leader, brought us tea, and listened carefully to what we had to say. We told them we wanted to see the emerald mines in the mountains because this area is known for its high quality emeralds. It's full of precious stones and ores, and it would really like to see it, but foreigners are not allowed there. This area is off limits to foreigners, you can't get there. But thanks to that Taliban council, we got the permission to enter. It was quite an extraordinary experience, I must say. Later that night, when we got back to Kabul, my fixer explained to me the meaning of that council. We have the departments of every ministry in every province. In the center, in the capital, we have uh, 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 ministries, and the, these ministries in all provinces, they have directorates. So from every department, they have collected one responsible man from intelligence, from police, from uh, army, in the previous government there was no, not a uh, commission like this, not facilities like this. We, have to uh, we don't have to, uh, even, you, you have seen, we directly met the secretary of uh, governor, we directly met vice governor, directly we met with Hafiz of the head of this commission. This letter which uh, with these uh, guests is, these are our commission, commission's guests. So, these are, uh, they are coordinated with uh, intelligence, police, also in governor house. So, please uh, don't make any uh, problem or any disturbance for them. Once we got this letter, we decided to stop for a snack. And then, some military patrol showed up again in a huge black, obviously armored SUV with some antennas on the roof. The antennas are there to jam any signals around, by the way, to prevent any possible attacks with the use of remotely controlled improvised explosive devices. And I must say that here, they can turn pretty much anything into an IED. This, for example, is a regular flashlight, the kind people often use in Afghanistan, especially in the countryside where they have no electricity. After the sunset, people use flashlights like this. This particular flashlight, however, was an IED. It was filled with explosives and they were activated by pushing the button over here and the IED would go off. Devices like these were used during the Civil War in places of mass gathering in order to inflict as much damage as possible. Decades of hostilities in the country have seen people make bombs looking like all kinds of mundane objects. Even my camera, for example, can be turned into an IED. And IEDs have been used widely all over Afghanistan. If you look at this loudspeaker, for instance, I bet you'd never guess that it was an IED because it really looks like an ordinary loudspeaker. But as it turns out, you could actually probably bring it somewhere like a rally and blow it up. But mostly objects like these were used, according to the label here, as booby traps. 
Say you're an unsuspecting civilian. You're walking down the street, see this thing, and think, oh, that's a loudspeaker. I might use a loudspeaker or sell it. And so you pick it up, press the button to try it, and it explodes right in your hands, killing you. It's just brutal, man. One more death trap looks like a regular building block, but in fact, it's a powerful magnet. When I held it close to a metal pole, it stuck to it with such a loud bang, almost like an explosion. It's a very powerful magnet. When I held this IED close to this pole, it nearly jumped out of my hand. The force of attraction was so big. The box itself isn't heavy, but the magnet is so powerful, I felt my hand pulled by it towards the pole. Terrorists are well known for their practice of recruiting followers to be used in suicide attacks. You probably all know the expression, suicide belt. In this museum, you can actually see what is usually inside such belts. This is the part of the vest that is fitted next to the explosives. So if you imagine a person, a suicide attacker, wearing a vest, inside the vest there will be layers of explosives. And this sheet with lots of metal balls will be covering the explosives. So when the attacker blows the vest up, the force of the explosion, boom, turns all these metal balls into deadly projectiles like bullets, hitting everything and killing everyone around. That's how dangerous these little balls are. When in 1994 these guys started to clean the territory of Afghanistan of all the mines and bombs, they made a calculation that the sum total of all the minefields on the territory of Afghanistan comes close to 1,200 square miles. Here they have the deminer equipment on display. It's what deminers have been using in Afghanistan to clear the land of mines. I've been told that when they started, they worked to defuse every mine they found. However, it has been a while already since the orders were given not to do it anymore, and instead of defusing the mines one by one, they destroy them. That's because defusing a single mine is not only time and labor consuming, it is also extremely risky, and many deminers have been killed whilst trying to defuse mines. Which is why no one is wasting time and resources now on all the mines that have been scattered across the country over the past 20 years while the Taliban fought NATO and the US troops. Everything they find these days gets destroyed and doesn't make it to this museum. So far, they've been able to clear about half the contaminated area by destroying a total of 75,000 mines. Now they say that there's still about 600 square miles of minefields left to work on. The worst thing about this situation is that after the Taliban came to power, the funding for this project was suspended. At the moment, no one is doing this work, which means that mines keep blowing up and hurting people, even though the war kind of ended more than three years ago. Go. 40 kilometers square still remaining and that's need to clear in uh, seven or ten years need to clear this whole area. And so already the, the mine action family, close coordination with the uh, DMAC, the director of DMAC of Afghanistan, so we prepared the extension uh, report uh, for the Afghanistan and we submitted the, to the New York uh, United Nations uh, for the extension of uh, Afghanistan. The explosive remnants of the war and the remaining risks of ISIS attacks are two of the reasons why the Taliban prefer to subject visitors from other countries to so many checks and even take time to talk to them at length. Their logic is simple. If visitors get killed here, they'll be held responsible. This guy here is obviously in charge. He is surrounded by guards with guns. He read our official permit letter, and then we found out that he is none other than the vice governor of the province. With a gun, naturally. At some point, the pavement ends, and we continue to ride the dirt road going higher into the mountains. As we climb, I keep seeing caves obviously made by people. We climb even higher, and it begins to snow. Getting out of the car doesn't feel like fun at all because it's very cold here and, as you can see, it's snowing. 
The snow is melting right away, which means all our clothes will get wet in no time. We're going to walk the rest of the way because cars can't go any further, so off we go, marching on foot. Soon we'll see what we came here for, the Emerald Mines of Afghanistan. We're leaving our car behind and there's another car with a Taliban security detail behind me. I'm trying to keep a low profile with my camera while filming, but it's there. And I'm told we're going to go somewhere over there, that's where the nearest mine is. Afghanistan does sit atop huge deposits of all sorts of valuable metals and gemstones. American geologists have assessed the local deposits' potential at $900 billion. There is iron, cobalt, gold, copper. They've also discovered large deposits of a rare metal that is in much demand these days, lithium. However, first and foremost, Panjshir is known for its emeralds above all. In terms of quality, they're among the world's finest. Check out the gorgeous Chromophonia necklace by Cartier, for example. Totally 199.02 carats, and they were sourced here. Despite the sanctions, Afghan emeralds are traded all over the world. Emeralds sold for $10 a piece in Afghanistan will be traded for $50 each in Dubai. The largest emerald mined here was sold by a dealer for $300,000. In the Emirates, they put a price tag of $2 million on it. And now, you will see how people are actually mining these gemstones here in Panjshir. That's what I feared the most. We'll have to cross this mountain stream by hopping from rock to rock. Oh dear. My chief concern is that I'm carrying the camera and other equipment. The rocks are very slippy. Oh my god! Hey, I made it! We go on to climb the slope, and it's still very slippery. Soon we see a power generator. It means the mine is somewhere close. This power generator you see here was delivered from China. They use it to power the drilling machines that drills holes in rocks. This is the kind of holes they drill with the help of the generator. And these guys here are the miners. As you can see, they don't have any protective clothing or gear, except the headlamps. One of them is just a kid. He looks no older than 15. Together with the miners, we continue to climb the mountain until we reach the entrance to a cave. They have brought us some rocks with emeralds to show. These green spots are emeralds. Green, you see? They are ammunition. After that, they break these rocks up to release the gemstones, polish them, and turn them into the emeralds that you can see in jewelry stores in rings, earrings, and so on. There are no supports inside the cave that consists of the tunnels that have been carved out by the miners. Goodbye, son! We're going underground in the Panjshir Mountains of Afghanistan. Once we reach the drilling site, the guys get ready to drill a hole that will be about four inches deep. This particular mining site is one of the most technically advanced in the area because they've got the electricity-powered drilling machine. In many other mines, people have to work without electricity because both the generator and the drilling machine are very expensive. They are about to begin drilling. It's going to be very loud. The tunnel gets immediately filled with the rock dust. All these dust particles get into your nose, throat, into your lungs. I think you can see them well on camera. We're all here covered with this dust head to toe. One of the guys goes on to fill the hole with some white powder, and I think we all get the idea of what's going to happen next. I'm getting quite nervous because the exit isn't very close. This thing in my hand is a wick. 
They're going to insert it into the hole in the rock, but first, they'll fill the hole with the explosive powder. I don't know what this powder is made of exactly, but I'm right next to the guy who's doing it. This young guy here keeps adding the powder into the hole they've drilled a minute ago. As you can see, he's already inserted the wick into the hole. They're going to light it, and then there's going to be a big boom. Check out how simple his tools are. He uses a scoop made of a plastic bottle to load the powder, and a wooden stick to fill up the hole tightly. Now? Now? Go, 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 go! Holy moly! <laughs> oh, sure. I'm good. I honestly didn't think I'd have to run that far. Fuck! I got really scared. Shall be fucking damned! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> that was something. I <sighs> thought we'd just have to get outside the entrance and, you know, take cover behind the corner, but once they got out, they kept shouting, go down, go down, keep going. And then I found out that some of the guys who were behind me had stayed behind. I guess things like this happen only in Afghanistan. When the guys were placing the explosives, they forgot about the chief engineer and my guard with the gun. They were left behind. But as you can see, here's another tunnel that was dug out by the miners, and so the two guys took cover inside this tunnel during those powerful explosions. They seem to be all right, although maybe a little shaken. Right now, there's this smell. Ooh. You know, some very strong, acrid odor? Damn, it's harsh. I don't know what this smell is. It reminds me of ammonia or sulfur. Really strong and acrid. Damn, my heart is still racing. The explosions crack a wall, and the guys start prying it with metal bars. Some rocks get loose and fall almost on their heads. This is the emerald we have just mined. How cool is that? After the explosion, some rocks fell down. The guys are now prying those rocks that are kind of loose but still stuck in the walls, and they've just found this emerald. I say, it's totally cool. The head of the operation takes over. He is the only one authorized to harvest the emeralds. He's using a pinch bar to get the gem-bearing piece of rock. And finally, the precious find is in his hands. These miners' work is akin to treasure hunting, because you never know what you're going to find. We were incredibly lucky today. I honestly didn't expect us to witness the miners finding any emeralds today, because it can usually take a very long time before you hit the load. Little emeralds like these don't bring us any profit. To us, this is a sign that we need to keep mining until we hit the mother load with big gems. Mohammed is in charge of this mining operation. These guys do everything by themselves at their own risk and peril. They all chip in to buy tools and equipment. They do all the work. They can work with no returns for months before they finally harvest a really valuable emerald. I've seen many people die during the mining operation. Some got hit by the explosion, some got buried under rocks. My friend here, for example, had a rock fall on his foot. Ever since, he's been walking with a limp and he is in constant pain. Getting out of these mountains isn't much easier than getting in. While I was filming, there was a sudden and heavy snowfall. The road got completely covered with snow. And that's how we had to make our way to our next destination. Kunduz. But first, we were invited to stay the night with the local chiefs. 
Now, a few words about Afghan hospitality. We were supposed to make a stop tonight in the nearest village, because there are no hotels around or anything, and we were invited to stay the night by one of the Taliban officials who lives in this village. And now another Taliban commander arrived to meet us. He also lives in the same village. And so he is now calling the first guy, telling him, it makes no sense for the guests to travel all the way to your place now when my house is ready and I can host them. And now they're sort of arguing over which one of them gets to host us tonight. Finally, we come to the house of their choice. We find out that we're being hosted by the head of the local government. All the local chiefs and elders seem to have gathered here. The first thing everyone does is pray. Then they just sit along the walls on soft cushions. It's dinner time, and one of the men puts a piece of plastic on the carpet and walks right on it while he distributes the food, starting with the flatbread. Then he brings the main course on plates, some meat and vegetables. There are no forks or spoons, People in Afghanistan pick up their food with a piece of flatbread and eat them together. Then comes time for the dessert. Everyone gets some water and fruit. When the men are done eating, they simply remove the sheet of plastic and the dining room becomes a sitting room or a bedroom. Needless to say, we were served by men only. I haven't seen a single woman in this village, although I'm sure they are somewhere there. During America's and other countries' presence in Afghanistan, a wrong culture was created in the country, especially here in Panjshir. American propaganda convinced all our young people, and almost all other people, that an Islamic state is bad for them. But now the Americans have fled, and the Islamic Emirate has been established, everything has changed. Now everybody knows that we have a very good government. You know it yourself, too, that Afghan people have always wanted a free life a free country. Now it's time for a little history, so that you can better understand why Afghanistan has been in a perpetual state of war for a very long time. Historically, Afghanistan's location has always been of strategic importance. If you look at the map, you'll see that Afghanistan connects Asia and India with the Middle East and further on with Europe and Africa. This is where the network of Eurasian trade routes, known as the Silk Road, was created by people as long ago as in the second century. Century BC. I am standing on one of the oldest roads in the world, the legendary Silk Road. Traveled for centuries by caravans from Asia to Europe and back, the Silk Road passed through the city of Bamiyan, once a home to the giant statues of Buddha carved in the local mountains. Behind me are the remnants of the old city and the old marketplace. It was destroyed by the Taliban during the first Taliban rule. They have a new marketplace now located in the city nearby. The Silk Road route stretched for 7,500 miles. From Xi'an in South China, they went all the way to the territories of present-day Bulgaria. It used to take a caravan up to 12 months to travel the Silk Road. The segment of the road located in Afghanistan was right about midway between the terminal stops. This was also a place known for its enormous, centuries-old Buddha statues. 20 years ago, they were blown up by the Taliban. Today, tourists come here to see what's left of them. Seeing all this with my own eyes feels absolutely incredible. Like I'm on some other planet in a fantasy world. And I can picture the times when this place was full of people buzzing with life and trade was flourishing. It's unbelievable. To be honest, I really didn't know that such a city existed. I knew about the giant Buddha statues in Afghanistan, but I couldn't imagine the scale of it all. It's out of this world. But let's talk a little bit more about history. So, imagine you've got a road travelled by merchants with all kinds of wealth, but aside from that, you've got absolutely nothing. This is the main problem in Afghanistan. Most of the country is covered with mountains and bare rocks, where nothing grows. And now, imagine trade caravans carrying the goods start showing up in this place where the locals are struggling to survive. What do they do when this happens? Obviously, they rob the caravans. Look at this mountain over there. The surface has a lot of holes in it. From a distance, it looks like a bunch of cave swallow nests. 
But when you get closer, you see that this is all man-made. This is, in fact, the ancient version of a multi-story apartment building. Its apartments were carved out in the mountain back in the days when the Silk Road was alive. The most amazing thing is that people live in these caves even today. Look, this may seem like an ordinary hill, but as you come closer, you see the entrance to a home with the women sitting and the children playing outside. This one of the thousands of families in, lived in caves in Bamiyan, but uh, they were really poor people. They didn't have uh, any air for uh, the growing and for uh, making it the product, and things like the wheat. This woman has three children, a son and two daughters, and an elderly mother. The woman's name is Gulifras. She and her family belong to another ethnic group in Afghanistan, the Hazaras. They are also Muslim, but the Hazara women don't have to hide their faces or avoid contact with men. So, Gulafros agreed to talk to us. Her husband works in the city, and she keeps the house. Winters are harsh in this part of Afghanistan, almost like in Russia. There are no forests to harvest wood or stone to build houses of. There are only bare mountains. So local people hide in caves. That's the only way for them to survive. I'm sitting in a millennia-old cave, visiting a family that actually lives in it today. And I'm going to give you a little room tour of this place. What I love about this room is that the floor is covered with a thick rug. It's nice to sit on, to walk on, and it helps to keep the place tidy. Here, you can see these shelves carved out of the rock. They were made by people who probably lived in this cave a thousand years ago or maybe even more. These shelves are a very useful feature because you can use them at night when it was dark. In case you need a light, you can put it on this shelf instead of the floor. A lamp or a candle, and this way you know it won't start a fire. On the other hand, these multiple burn marks on the ceiling tell me that there was a time when people most likely made a fire in this cave too. It's something hard to believe, but all six people in this family share this very room, the only one they have. They could have tried to carve out more rooms, but keeping them warm at night in the winter would be a huge problem, because the family can't afford to buy firewood. On the upside, living in a small cave makes it easier to keep warm during the winter with one oven. And the major reason this family chose to live here is because they're very poor people. They don't have any money. So they made a home in a cave because they can't pay anything for a real house. They pay no rent for this place. Even here, people are trying to make their home a little nicer. They have a mirror on the wall and some photos of the children. They even have a clock, although it's broken. Time seems to have stopped for these people. And the worst part is that nothing might change for their children too when they grow up. Life in Afghanistan is regulated by the Sharia law. It's a very conservative religious state with very strict rules that I, as a visitor, must observe. Some of these rules regulate contact with women. No matter where I go in Afghanistan, I am not allowed to talk to women, to take their photos, and I am not allowed to be in one house or in one room together with women. If I were to break any of these rules, the consequences would be disastrous. But right now, we 
we are in Bamiyan, and this place is different from the rest of Afghanistan because here, many of these laws have exceptions. And here, I had a chance to actually talk to some local women. On the orders of the Taliban, women's faces in this ad were painted over. The ad is for a clothing store. Now, we can see what it looks like inside. The women who work here are not covering up their faces and have no problem being around men. Uh, just they come in here because uh, the schools and universities close it. They come in here for uh, they want to find some money because they live very poverty. They don't have any money, uh, mm -hmm. and also some of them still have father because died or killed by the the, period, the civil wars and. Uh, the main ethnic group in Bamiyan is the Kazara, not Pashtuns, which explains more freedoms people have in everyday life. Nonetheless, women here are still not allowed to study or simply go from one city to another without a male escort. Girls agree to communicate, but they still choose their words very carefully. <laughs> Bamiyan is the only city where you can see what all of the country could be like, but being here somehow feels warm and friendly. For example, here is a pharmacy, and a woman who works here is playing quietly with her children. Anywhere in the streets and in the market, there are both men and women, and it looks absolutely natural. And so unlike Kabul, where only men are out in public places, and activists who advocate for women's rights are threatened, sometimes kicked out of the country or even thrown in jail. Our next destination is the city of Kunduz, and getting there is another risky and dangerous trip. We have to drive across a mountain ridge, and this road counts as the most dangerous in Afghanistan. As you can see, there is a tunnel on the right, but our driver prefers not to go in there. That's because it can collapse at any time. In another tunnel, we pass by a car stuck in the dirt because the road surface has completely disintegrated. It's been worn out by all the passing cargo trucks and buses. We'll have to drive through dozens of tunnels like this. All the roads I've seen in Afghanistan until now don't even come close to this one. This is the hardest road of all. We've been on a very rough ride for many hours now, climbing and climbing and climbing all the time, and we haven't reached the highest point yet where northern Afghanistan begins. Also, since the road surface is so badly worn out and broken, the local authorities often stop the traffic in one of the two lanes. This means if they, for instance, shut down the lane for the vehicles climbing the mountain, they will have to wait for a few hours while the only open lane is being used by the vehicles descending into the valley. All these roads and tunnels were built by the Soviet Union 60 years ago, and no one has really been doing much maintenance on them ever since. Look at this tunnel. It looks kind of cool. Soviet troops have crossed the Afghan border on December 25th, 1979 at 3 p.m. Moscow time. One convoy is traveling from Tumez to Kabul and another from Gushki to Herat. Only Soviet troops can save the government from the onslaught of the Mujahideen rebels. Russian Empire began fighting for this territory back in the early 19th century. First, the very same Napoleon, who later attacked Russia and burned Moscow, proposed a joint Franco-Russian invasion of Afghanistan in 1801. Russian Emperor Paul I sent 20,000 Cossacks on this mission, but soon was assassinated and the plan was terminated. 
The intention was to challenge the British Empire. They had maintained control of India and its neighboring territories. This rivalry between the 19th century Russia and Britain lasted for over a century and was called the Great Game. In 1919, Afghanistan became free of British hegemony, and the first country to officially recognize its independence was Soviet Russia. It was founded only two years earlier. The USSR had been pumping a lot of money into Afghanistan pretty much throughout the entire 20th century. I think it's really amazing, given how much time has passed and how much combat this place has seen, that this infrastructure is still functioning. It's true when they say things built in those days last forever. Now we're stuck in yet another tunnel because the cars in front of ours cannot drive through the snow. They have summer tires. The locals have come up with a unique service. They patrol these tunnels looking for those in need of help and offer to put special chains of their own making on the traveler's summer tires for a fee. A guy would put these chains on and ride along in that vehicle until the end of this segment of the road, until the road becomes easier. Throughout the 1960s, 70s and 80s, the Soviet Union built over 140 infrastructure assets in Afghanistan. The official government was backed by the Soviet Union, but got increasingly challenged by Islamist guerrilla groups by the late 70s. The insurgents operated mostly in the mountainous areas and were actively supported by the USA in what we might call the next round of the Great Game. In 1978, a communist revolution established a socialist state and started a civil war in Afghanistan. Subsequent infighting prompted the Soviet Union to interfere. We're now in the part of the tunnel that has no windows or any ventilation. There is very little air in here and many vehicles are stuck in a huge traffic jam. This tunnel is basically filled with the exhaust fumes which is why we've got to be careful and keep our windows up to avoid breathing these fumes as much as we can help it. Even though I see now this local guy walking right outside, he's a traffic controller and he seems used to it. So we're currently at almost 10,000 feet above sea level and there is little oxygen in the air. Look at this opening in the wall. You get an idea of how thick the exhaust fumes are in this tunnel. We still manage to make progress somehow, but the trucks are all stuck in a jam. Some guys in passenger cars were trying to bypass them, but instead only created another traffic jam. While we're struggling to get through, I'll get back to the country's history. On December 27, 1979, Soviet special forces stormed the palace of the leader of the opposition, effectively assassinating him. This operation led to a decade-long war that claimed the lives of at least 15,000 Soviet soldiers, and eventually saw the Soviets withdraw the troops completely in 1989. The USSR lost control of Afghanistan and was dissolved a couple of years later. Finally, we're free! We got out of this tunnel! Oh, I don't know how much time we spent inside, but the daylight is hurting my eyes now. Here you can see how many trucks and cars are stuck on the road waiting for their turn to enter this tunnel. The entrance is temporarily closed for all downhill traffic because, as you've seen for yourself, that situation in the tunnel is bad enough. This means that the uphill traffic has very little room on the road between the endless rows of vehicles and the snow-covered cliff. One wrong maneuver can cost us our lives. The situation really sucks. We've spent six or seven hours in this traffic jam already, at 10,000 feet above sea level. The traffic is jammed both ways. The progress is very slow. The vehicles move inch by inch. The worst part is that there's no end to this traffic jam. We don't know whether it'll take us two more hours or six more hours, or maybe we'll even have to spend the night on the road right here. In total, we've covered 185 miles to get to Kunduz. It took us 15 long and painful hours in Kunduz. Nothing reminds of the hell we've just been through. There is no snow, the sun is bright, the trees are green, and the streets are empty. Except a couple of tuk-tuks. We drive to a local car park. Hundreds of cars parked here in the mud. Many are damaged. I see a guy changing a tire, then a few others looking under the hood. 
This car park is also one huge outdoor car repair shop. You can find rusty Soviet tanks abandoned and rotting in the fields all over the country. The locals have painted them with some bright colors as a kind of tourist attraction. The last foreign power that tried to straighten things out here was the United States of America. In 1996, most of the country was under the Taliban's control, including Kabul, where they had killed the president. The same year, the Taliban agreed to host another like-minded terrorist organization, the Al-Qaeda, and its leader, Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden was already on the USA's wanted list at the time, although not yet at the very top. In 1998, Al-Qaeda conducted the US Embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania. Everything changed on September the 11th, 2001, when terrorists crashed two planes into the twin towers of the World Trade Center in New York City. President George W. Bush demanded that the Taliban give up Bin Laden and all other ringleaders of Al-Qaeda, presumed to be the organizers of the deadliest terror attack in history. The Taliban refused to comply, and the USA declared the war on terror and invaded Afghanistan, starting the longest military operation in American history. It lasted for two decades and failed to achieve its goals. Bin Laden was killed a decade after the September 11 attacks while he was hiding in Pakistan. The Taliban retook control of Afghanistan in 2021, following the hurried withdrawal of the US troops from the country. The Americans left behind a lot of weapons, vehicles, and ammo. Today, the US tactical gear and equipment can be found on sale in Kabul markets. I am now at the Bush Market. It's named after the US 43rd President George W. Bush, the president who sent American troops to Afghanistan. Here, you can find any kind of equipment and gear left behind by the US troops, such as body armor, fatigues, combat boots. People say you can even find here night vision devices. I haven't found many interesting items, only a flashlight, a compass, and a broken GPS navigator. The only thing you can find in real abundance on this market is the US combat helmets. Some vendors have lots of them. Look, it's been cut. <laughs> we found one who doesn't only sell them, but he upgrades them and sells the upgraded product. I'm now watching this Afghan guy upgrade a US combat helmet. As you can see, he cuts off some parts first and then he has to apply soft material to the edges. They say it's leather, to me it looks like imitation leather. So, as you can see, he's using a bottle of glue to go on. and glue this piece of imitation leather to the helmet to make sure it's all nice and neat, and there are no sharp edges anywhere. And now I'm going to show you the ready product, what it looks like after these guys have cleaned, painted, and upgraded old American helmets with China-made devices. Here it is. Here you've got your headlamp and headphones and some other devices, but all of them are from China, not the US. Every single man in Afghanistan knows how to handle a gun. The main ethnic population group here is Pashtuns. If you remember House Greyjoy's motto in the Game of Thrones, we do not sow. Well, it's a perfect fit for Pashtuns too. Pashtuns are by origin a nomadic pastoral ethnic group. They've got their code of honor called Pashtunwali. Some of its main rules are bravery, courage, honor, righteousness, revenge. 
This code originated back in the Middle Ages and hasn't changed since. There are also some practices that people from other countries find, to say the least, surprising. For example, girls can be dressed like boys so they could work. For example, any of these boys selling spant, the smoke believed to ward off misfortune and evil spirits, might in fact be a girl. Money. No, but your portions is something that is kind of, kind of be happening in a lot of families and nobody talks about it. The reason is that because as a, as a boy, you know, you can, you, can, you can work on the street, you can work, you can work as a, uh, you can go to the market and you can push a, a, a trolley or something and, and get money that way, you do some other jobs, some other works that a woman is not allowed. So families out of desperation, that's also economics, uh, out of desperation. Uh, the, the girls of the family, especially when they don't have any other choice, what do they do? They just cut their hair off and they, you know, put a band-aid around them and they, and they just you know, dress up like, like boys and that's it. It goes really wrong when a girl like this grows up and becomes a young woman. It's extremely hard for them to go back to being obedient and submissive, like the traditional family lifestyle requires. Such girls are usually married off against their will and undergo a period of extremely painful readjustment, some even setting themselves on fire. There is one more tradition with a similar name, Bachabazi, and that's a real nightmare too. Bachabazi is a practice when young boys are dressed as girls. It's a very shameful uh, part of our, our, uh, our customs or our, I don't know, custom, I should say, in some parts of Afghanistan. Because it's actually, you know, is 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 using young boys uh, to become their, you know, their uh, kind of a, their mistresses, and they use them as a as a as a as a woman. Known as dancing boys, often boys are managed by a pimp, and the boys are made to dance at dinner parties while guests bid on them like at an auction. When boys like these grow up, they are usually set free by their former masters, who may even help them find another job. But as a rule, readjustment is very hard for them, and many end up being underground sexual workers for life. I've had the chance to hear about these shocking traditions from Afghanistan's famous journalist and women's rights activist, Mabuba Saraj. She is probably the only woman in the country who is not afraid to criticize the Taliban. She's actually of royal descent. In 1978, she was put in prison by the communists and then forced into exile. She was able to return only 26 years later and refused to leave when the Taliban reclaimed power. I don't want the world to think that, you know, here I am sitting in, in you know, and, and there is no danger whatsoever. That's not the case. Because in Afghanistan, there is no personal, individual security does not exist. That security of mine is gone. I don't have it. No, I mean, that possibilities are there. They can put me in jail, they can kill me, they can send somebody to kill me. I mean, those things have happened and they can happen again. She is often regarded as the grandmother of all Afghan women. She is well known internationally. She was included on Time's list of the 100 most influential people in the world in 2021. She could have had a good life in the United States, writing and speaking about the abuse of women's rights in Afghanistan, but she chose to stay home right here. I have decided that honestly, as far as the fear is concerned, I only have fear from God. I really do. And I've given myself to Allah 100%. I, I, this is who I am as a Muslim. And so that's his power, you know. And he's been looking after me and he is, he's been protecting me. So that's today, anytime when I need the protection, it's him that I'm asking. The members of the Taliban are predominantly Pashto. They are very tough guys with pretty rigid views of the world. When they took over Afghanistan in 1996, for example, they banned music, TV, video and phone cameras, mirrors, and any use of images of people anywhere. The most messed up thing, however, is their attitude to women. In their view, a woman's main function is to give birth to new soldiers. So when the Taliban returned in 2021, it was clear that women's rights and freedoms would suffer a lot. The more time passes and we are where we are, the more it takes us back. Don't forget every single year of a situation like this is pushing Afghanistan back at least 20 years. Try to catch up is not going to be very bright. 
because we have to work on a lot of things that we haven't done now. So, no, a bright future I don't see for Afghanistan. I'm terribly sorry about that. It just kills me, breaks my heart. The women's rights in Afghanistan does not exist after the Taliban arrived. Whatever was given to them, whatever we gained, whatever was handed to us or whatever we could take, every single one of them, from the smallest to the biggest, everything was taken away. And that starting with the right to education, which is the most simplest and the, the rights for everybody. The girls of Afghanistan, the young girls, after the sixth grade, can go to, to mid-school and after that to high school and then to university. That's also taken away from them. For them, the right to go to a hammam and, and, and a public bath has been taken away. The right for them to go to a, uh, to a doctor on their own, that has been taken away. The right for them to go and, 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 uh, um, and, and sit in a park with their families, that has been taken away. So things have been taken away from the women of Afghanistan that the way I see it is like erasing. Of course, I wanted to hear the other side's view on this, that of a Taliban representative. And I had the opportunity to ask some questions about education and women's rights to the head of the district who hosted us one night. If we take a close and careful look at the matter, we'll see that Islam values and fosters education more than any other religion in the world. The Holy Quran says that Allah says, if two men are equal and one is educated while the other is not, the educated man is better. That's what Allah says. There are many ayat or verses in many surahs or chapters of the Quran. Our Prophet says that you must learn. And we open schools in this district in time for the new academic year. I agree that no country can be successful without knowledge. Knowledge is what you learn about your God, about the holy book, which is why education is necessary, and we are promoting it in Afghanistan. Representatives of the Taliban said that the ban on education for girls is temporary. It's been temporary for three years now, however. Many of the girls who had been studying hard to take exams in universities were simply forbidden. The education system is open to all boys. We've got colleges, universities, we've opened many religious schools, madrasas. As for women, it's all about the problem of their safety. We are now working to create a place where women could study and be safe. We need to have an environment created for our women, for our daughters, where they can go and learn things. But we need to make sure that they are separated from bonds, and then, they can be free to study. Maboba says that all these excuses about safety are simply lies. It's very funny, they really don't explain these things. Uh, they always say, well, the schools are going to open. Right now there are some, you know, we are working on the curriculum. We are working on, on how to get the girls safely to schools. Uh, tra their transportation is a question. Although they, are, they have opened up madrasas and thousands of them all over Afghanistan, and, and those madrasas apparently are taking girls, but the madrasa is not supposed to be taking the place of, of, uh, of official higher education at all. Madrasas, they always existed in Afghanistan, maybe not at this, at this level and as many as right now, but they have always been here. And the girls were going to, to madrasas, like the way the boys were going, but not to, to, to get education on, on everything. The t other topics, the topics of the world, the chemistry, the biology, the history, the geography, the, how shall I say, the balance of, of, of the social balance in Afghanistan. Because what you're going to be having in another year or two, uh, definitely another two years, you're going to have a whole, Afghanistan is going to have a whole lot of young boys that they're all believing in Taleb's um, ideology. And, and the girls, the same way.
and the, to the, 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 the process of being able to, for them to, to learn and to think for themselves and to analyze the situation by themselves. And we all had that respect and listened to our uh, elders in the family, but now that's dying. So it's really very bad for the future of Afghanistan. The things she's talking about are horrible. She says that the Taliban are reinstating medieval customs when women were treated as possessions, that men could sell or trade. And possessions don't need an education. Because a girl in a family is, is like, is like um, how shall I say, is like having money. It's like something that you can give money with. They decide, you know, problems of by, by giving buds, when they give a, bud, a, a woman as a bud, uh, you know, in the case of a... Of a of a, um, how shall I say, a law um, um, killing or some, some things, you know, problems with two tribes or two people. Uh, they give one woman a bud to the other family and they try to solve the problem. So the women are used like that. The women are used as exchanges. When the Taliban came to power, over five million people fled the country. And yet, not everyone can leave. Human rights activists say that today, about half a million girls in Afghanistan don't have access to any education. They may end up growing up illiterate, pressured by harsh religious rules, and gradually accepting this life, these rules of the game.